Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Broadcast to Post, Keycode Media's series hosting industry professionals discussing broadcast and production technology topics that you care about. We also invite partners to provide brief presentations around their solutions to today's challenges in our industry. I'm your host, Jeff Sangpil, the Chief Technologist here at Keycode Media. In this episode, we're talking about editing long-form and episodic documentaries. With sets around the world shut down, the options for creating original content are limited. Or are they? Hot off the release of the hit documentary miniseries ESPN's The Last Dance, productions across the country are digging into their archives and looking to create engaging content that consists primarily of previous episodes, interviews, and sound bites. And now, with stay-at-home orders, production teams need a better way to find, collaborate, edit, and finish these assets. During this session, Keycode Media is going to dig into the details for creating an efficient, budget-sensitive workflow for long-form and episodic docs. Joining us today is Dan Swetlick, who's earned himself two Best Edited Documentary Ace Eddie Awards for his work on groundbreaking feature documentaries. He's currently the owner of Stitch Editing, a perfectly formed company of film editors working on docs, television, music videos, and commercials. We'll also be inviting Avid Technology to provide tips and tricks for documentary editing, tools within Media Composer, and other Avid solutions that productions are editing long-form documentaries and hour-long series with. They've been leveraging phonetic tools like Script Sync, Phrase Find, and Phonetic Search. How do these content creators and storytellers delve into and use their existing assets to collaborate, edit, and finish new tales from existing material they already own? Before we get into that, I want to introduce Keycode Media to those who are new to our community. Keycode Media is an industry-leading systems integrator with a small army of engineers specialized in broadcast, post-production, and audiovisual solutions. If you need equipment, we have it. If you have a complex problem, we've likely solved it. If you need support, our engineers are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, let's jump into it. First, we'll be speaking with Dan Swetlick. Dan, how are you and the team at Stitch doing? Uh, we're doing fine, actually. Um, you know, I think business slowed down a little bit for the commercial side of things, but not as much as I was afraid of. Um, it, everybody's been working remotely. Um, uh, we're we're doing commercials. Some of the other edit, one of the other editors is working on another documentary. I think it's Charlie Trotter was the the chef's name. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then we still got uh, the commercial work going on. But everybody has just sort of uh, headed home to the safety of their homes with drives. And it's you know the assistants are going a little crazy trying to keep everybody up to date um, and in sync. But it's been working out fine. Very cool. Um, how has collaboration changed over these past few months with these teams now working from home instead? You know, it's it's different. Um, it, it's a little bit slower. Um, I'm not sure the collaboration has changed that much as much as the process has changed. Um, you know, I'm, I've been working on uh, this documentary about uh, Pope Francis um, for the last year or so, um, year and a half. And one of the things that it's being uh, handled by a studio in Prague, uh, PFX is the studio there. So when I was in Prague last year, obviously it was very easy. Everybody was working off of um, a Nexus system. You know, the assistants were right there. The media could come in and out. Now that i have sort of not only back in the States, but at home, Everything has to, if we get new footage, it has to go through Prague first so that they can ingest it. And then they'll send me a link to the MXF files, obviously. So there's a lot more steps to go through. It's a little more cumbersome, I guess, um, I would have to say. But then the collaboration side of it is I will work on a section of the film, make a quick time, uh, send that to the director, and then we'll talk about it. So... I don't think it's hindered the collaboration at all, but it has made the whole process a little slower. Well, I mean, we've always wanted a little more time, so <laughs> I, guess, I guess we've got it. Um, so you've been creating documentaries for quite some time now. Notably, you've gotten rewards for your work on Sicko and An Inconvenient Truth. 
Um, how have you seen documentary filmmaking change over the past few years? For example, have streaming partners like Netflix and Disney pushed changes that kind of affect the way you or your team operates? I would have to say no, it hasn't changed how we operate. I think it's clearly there's a much larger demand for documentaries, for uh, you know, hour-long series. Um, I think in some respects, it has really put the documentary genre into the mainstream. I think people are a lot more aware of documentaries. I think there's more of a demand for documentaries. And I think you know, it, it has helped that genre because I think people like to watch documentaries at home. They don't necessarily want to go to a cinema to see a documentary. Um, so I, I think documentaries were on the verge of becoming a little more obscure than they have been and Netflix and those kinds of streaming services have really resurrected interest in documentary. Yeah, and from what I've seen, interest in unusual topics like heavy metal bands will have a documentary. That didn't used to happen. Yeah. Um, Follow up on that. Has your overall approach to editing changed from all of these new partners involved and the new interest involved? No, I, no, not really. I mean, like, I think it's just the, there's increased demand. People seem to be scrambling to uh, come up with material. So that's, that's been great for us. You know, it's kept us very busy. But as far as how I approach a project, it hasn't really changed that. Just telling a story is still telling a story. Um, Pretty much. As a documentarian, what features of Avid Media Composer have been instrumental in making the editorial process for you more efficient? I mean, the one thing I tell people about um, is script sync, uh, especially if you're working with, uh, you know, on a, on a movie that has a lot of uh, on-camera interviews. Um, you know, you get those transcribed, uh, you, you put them into the script sync system, and once you've sort of tasted that, you can you can never go back. You know the fact that you can be reading through a transcript, double click on a word or a sentence, and the footage goes right to that spot. Um, you can search for phrases uh, and pull up. You know every time somebody says this in the entire project, and they're just a double click away to to access access that footage. So I, I mean. I would be terrified to try and work on, you know, a, a feature length documentary without script sync. That would just, that would not work. Or at least it wouldn't work out well and you need a lot more of that time they're talking about. Um, yeah. And, and I know one, one of the last projects I did when I walked in for the first meeting where they were showing me some of the bins and I said, wait a minute, this is not Avid. This is Premiere. And the producer said, oh, should we have talked about that? And I said, yeah, we probably should have talked about that. And, you know, they had been gathering shooting footage for a year um, and I convinced them to switch over to Avid simply because of script sync. I said, it's going to be painful now uh, and it may take a month or two to get everything switched over, but it will save us three to six months on the back end having script sync as a tool. Makes sense. Well, other than script sync, you know, at Stitch, you collaborate with some very talented folks. We use a variety of tools. Um, what parts of Media Composer have uh, developed uh, Avid Envy in your non-Media Composer users? It's mostly that script sync. You know, when you tell Premiere guys about, you know, what it can do, it, you just get that sort of blank stare of like, oh, God, I wish I had that. Understandable. Um, Avid's phonetic tools where it can understand and make searchable the dialogue, how have they enrich the process and have they eliminated some of the repetitive tasks for yourself or producers or assists? Yeah, I mean, I think if you've got a mountain of archival footage that you clearly don't have the time or the budget to send out to have transcribed, it would be kind of silly to, to do that. The phrase find can really help you just not spend you know, an entire afternoon or a couple of days searching through our archival to find something that somebody said. Um, you know, that's also what they make assistance for. You can tell them to go find it, but that's, you know, that's a lot of man hours for a, a pretty simple task. So being able to use phrase find as an option for searching through archival audio um, is pretty, pretty cool. Quite true. Um, what would, 
you'd like the next generation tool of tools to have available in Media Composer or in your media ecosystem? Uh, I mean, I think one of the things I'd like to have, it, it's pretty, pretty small stuff. Um, I would love to be able to have more than one sequence open at a time. Um, you know, the, when I, I've worked on Final Cut and Premiere in the past, um, and, you know, the fact that you can have multiple sequences and just drag stuff back and forth between the sequences uh, is a pretty nice feature to have. Um, I, I would really love to have the audio effects be real time. It's, um, I'm still kind of amazed that we still have to render audio effects. Um, the waveform drives me nuts. The, um, the fact that it just seems to kind of come and go and it's constantly trying to rewrite. Um, another thing would be great, it would be able to have the option to match back to a sequence um, rather than the original clip. Because I tend to go through footage and pull a lot of select sequences. And sometimes I would want to get back to, the, to that sequence by matching back rather than going back to the original clip. Kind of a gripe session rather than a. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's more, more like feature requests. And everybody always likes feature requests. Yeah. Um, so, what would you tell filmmakers currently in school who want to become documentarians? Uh, take a writing class. Um, I learned very quickly in the first couple projects I was on that uh, the writing is done in the editing room. Um, I can't say that's the case for every single documentary out there. That's what it's been like for me. Um, and sometimes uh, the, the editor is really the one who does the basic writing of the show. Uh, you can be very collaborative with the director who many times wants to be the writer also. Um, some projects we've had writers on, but it still gets made up in the editing room. Um, you don't get handed a script like you would in the narrative world that you just sort of follow and, and use the best takes. I'm not saying that that's, you know, any easier, but it's, it's more like you're handed a block of marble and told to find the sculpture inside of it. Um, it's, it's a real process of discovery. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, there's a lot of trial and error involved. I work uh, with Mark Monroe, who's a great writer, and he always says, you know, at the beginning of a project, we're going to make a really bad movie first, and then we're going to figure out how to make it good. That's definitely fair. So then what would you tell editors who are in school how they should proceed once they have that degree in hand? Um, you know... Take any position you're offered if it feels like it, it could lead to something. Um, you know, you don't, a lot of kids walk out of school and think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a director uh, my, for my first job out of school. Maybe, you know, I, it has happened. But I think what I've seen in this business is that uh, if somebody just gets a foot in the door and, you know, at a lot of editing facilities, it's usually you start in the vault or you start as a runner. Um, and uh, it's not very appealing, but the thing is, you're in a position of opportunity. Um, if you get in with the company and they start to see that you've got talent, you've got fire in your belly, uh, then when there's a panic and they need some more manpower to do something, it'll be that, hey, you moment where somebody says, hey, you, if you know how to use an app and get over here, start doing this. And suddenly uh, you're looked at in a very different light than just the vault guy. So take any position you can get and turn that into an opportunity uh, to, to show your stuff. That makes perfect sense. Uh, place I used to work at, the vault guy, his, one of his projects just went live on Netflix last week. So <laughs> yeah. you can be the vault guy and still be a, you know, a filmmaker like that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, so many of my assistants uh, in the commercial world have gone on to become my competition, you know, so, and, it, you know, sometimes uh, that stings a little bit. For the most part, I, I love seeing that, you know, if, if somebody has, like, proven their mettle as an assistant, and then they get the opportunity to sit in that editor's chair and prove, prove it then, too, that's the way it works. Awesome. 
Well, Dan, thanks for joining us today and talking about uh, the tools, the trade, um, the times. Uh, really great to have had you here. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Keycode and Dan. Great presentation. My name is Michael Krulik, Video Product Evangelist for Avid out of Los Angeles. And with me today is Corey Tedro, Senior Solutions Specialist from Avid out of Burlington, Massachusetts. And we're going to give you a demo of mainly of some of the things that Dan did talk about in the presentation. Uh, being able to collaborate and work, you know, being able to work remotely. Uh, that's part of Avid's video post pipeline. So we have all of the tools as far as editorial, managing media and assets, with Avid Nexus being the heart of storage here. But we do want to get into some of the things that Dan did talk about with, with Phrase Find and Script Sync. And then I'll get into Media Central editorial management after that. But I'm going to hand it off initially to Corey, who's going to give you an overview of Media Composer and this amazing feature called Phrase Find. Hi, my name is Corey Tedro, and I'm a solutions specialist with Avid. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the Phrase Find option inside of Avid Media Composer. Phrase Find is a powerful tool that enables you to locate clips quickly and easily. And it's included with Media Composer Ultimate, and it's an option that can be added to any subscription or perpetual license of Media Composer. So PhraseFind uh, automatically analyzes and indexes all of the audio in your project, and it creates a phonetic database that allows you to search on the spoken word. So let's see what that looks like. So here I am in Media Composer. I'm going to bring up the Find window. And this is a tool that's inside any, any copy of Media Composer. This is built in. But with the PhraseFind option, you get extra abilities inside of the Find window. So let's do a find on the word 15. And first I'm going to do a basic find and you'll see I get no results. So what a basic find is doing is it's searching on metadata. It's certain it's searching on the written word. So that means that I don't have any clips that are named 15. I don't have any markers with the word 15 written in them or any comments. Now if I do a phrase find search on the same criteria, you'll see I get lots of results. So let's take a look at my first hit here. And 15 or 20 minutes digging around. Let's look at another one. It takes about 15 hours out of my week. So you get the idea. Basically, what's happened is now I'm getting search results on any of the clips that have the spoken word 15 in them. And it's bringing me basically right to that word. This is a phonetic engine, a phonetic database that's basically searching on um, how words sound. One of the things I want to point out here in this window is I have a score column. So this is basically how confident the phrase find engine is that this is the word I'm looking for. So those first few results that uh, we looked at, those are up in the 90s. It ranks things anywhere from 100 down to 50. So we come down here and we look at ranked items that are in the 50s or the 60s and take a listen. I can set up a scene bin having never even watched. So you'll see she's saying scene bin, set up scene bin as opposed to 15. Sounds similar, but not exactly what I'm looking for. But it sort of helps bring home the point that this is all phonetic. It's all searching on how things sound. So let's do another example. Um, this is a project that interviewed, we, where we interviewed lots of different Avid editors. You'll see here on my, um, in my timeline, I have Catherine Haight, who was one of the editors. So let me search on her last name, Haight. I'm going to spell it differently because, again, this doesn't care how things are spelled. It just wants to know how things are how things sound. So I get lots of results. Let's bring up our first hit. Kind of take, help you have more. So that's not the editor I was looking for, and she's not saying what I wanted her to say. So what I can do to narrow things down is actually type in her whole name, because that's really what I'm looking for. And there you see I've done this before, so it remembers that, and I can just click on it. So that's a great tool if you're searching on the same thing over and over. It remembers it, and you can just click on that, and it takes you right there. So now you'll see I've searched on her full name. I get a lot fewer hits with a, a lot greater accuracy, and we take a look. I'm Catherine Haight, and I'm an editor. So that's exactly what I was looking for. Basically, give me all the clips where she's introducing herself pointing out that I don't have to search on just a single word. I can search on phrases. 
uh, and multiple words to really narrow down exactly what I'm looking for. Let's take a couple, uh, take a look at a couple of other things here inside the find window. You'll see down here on the left, I have a bin index and a phrase find index. And these are indicators to me of how much of the content in my project has been indexed. The bin index means that all of the bins in my project have been indexed. And the phrase find index basically means is it done indexing all of the audio files inside those bins. So if they're solid green, that means that everything that's in my project has been indexed. So I can be confident that when I'm doing searches, it's going to search across everything in my project. I happen to be um, on a single instance of Media Composer here. So I'm just on my laptop working in a standalone environment. This feature also works in shared environments. So if I were working in a collaborative environment where I had multiple media composers connected to shared storage, as long as I have a bin from someone else's project in my project, I can search across it. So it doesn't matter where the media is, if it's on shared storage, as long as I have the bin in my project that I want uh, I want to search on, that content in that bin becomes available to me. So again, a very powerful tool that can also be used in a collaborative environment to expand your ability for searching across um, multiple, multiple bins and projects on a system. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is down here, you'll see I'm working with, the, with English as my language. We support uh, over 20 different languages with the phrase find option. And the beauty of it is that it means that I don't have to painstakingly uh, log clips and add markers and comments to make sure that I can find what I'm looking for later, because that's basically not needed when I can search on any of the spoken words that I am looking for. And a great example of how uh, this tool is used in the real world is uh, there's lots of editors that will use this for what's uh, called frankenbiting. So basically, I need to create some dialogue or a line that wasn't actually spoken on set. I can do that by using my phrase find engine to quickly find all the instances of a certain word when I'm trying to create dialogue that was actually never spoken. So again, a very powerful tool, and this is an option that is available for Avid Media Composer. Wow, that's just amazing technology. Thanks, Corey. So Dan talked about another feature with Media Composer called Script Sync. Now, Corey talked about phrase find and how you can phonetically search. No transcription has to be done there. But imagine you do have a transcription. You have an interview that somebody has gone in and created a text file. Maybe you're working on something scripted and you have a script. Uh, well, you have the tools inside of Media Composer. You've actually had them for years where I could say new script. Now, the standard scripting tool is a manual process of marking where the dialogue is. But Script Sync, again, uses that technology of phrase find and lets me sync up to the written word. Now, I've gone in and taken a piece of media, uh, Virginia Katz. She won an Ace Eddie Award for editing Dream Girls. Uh, she's edited God and Mo Gods and Monsters, Beauty and the Beast. So I have a text file that I just imported, and it comes up as just, you know, the simple written word. So here is what I typed in. I actually just did this in you know, text edit. But again, a simple TXT file. It could be from Final Draft. It could be something you've typed in. And I've just created a little transcription of an interview with Ginny where I can now go in and line it using the power of Script Sync. So let's go ahead and open up. Here's the interview with Ginny. Got it, and I thought, mm, let me try it this way. So we want to take this video now and line it to the written word. So basically you're highlighting the portion of the script. Again, this is just a very simple demonstration. There's some great videos online which show um, maybe more detail in how, working, uh, in how you work with Script Sync. So I'm going to highlight the portion of the script that I want to line. So I'm just going to take a chunk of it. And then I'm going to take the video and point to that area that I just selected. And all I'm saying is, in this area, take this video clip and now line it by the written word. And this is great. So I highlight the clip. This could be uh, multiple shots, could be multiple angles. You can actually get a really amazing high-level scripted window here with your video. And I'm going to choose 
script sync. Again, you do have tools which let you manually sync the script to your video, but using script sync, but using script sync, it lets me choose the language that I want. And we have a set of up to 20 different languages that you can sync to. The tracks, uh, skip lines that contain capital letters and parentheses, that has to do with more scripted television where there's a character name or maybe actions. This is just a simple text file. There's you know no delineation between the interviewer and Ginny. Um, select dialogue lets you tab if there are tabs where stuff is formatted. And I simply want to select OK. So it's just basically going through and now looking at the same phonetic index that was done with phrase find, looking at the written word, and is now going to make marks where those words are said in relation to the video. And look at that. So you'll see that I now have a mark basically where every line of dialogue is as the lines written down here. So if I want to go into my video where she says gods and monsters, Mr. Holmes, I simply double click at that mark and it takes me to uh, gods and monsters, um, Mr. Holmes, Fifth Estate. That's amazing. So if I want to go and look at any, you know, take any part of the script and I want to find that piece of media, I don't have to play that down. Again, phrase find just lets me type in the word to take it there. But if you want to look at an actual script or transcription and go to a point, say I want to go to where she says, and basically from that point on, double click. I was hooked. And basically from that point on, started my apprenticeship. Now, besides having the actual text right here, you can use the same searching mechanism or find that Corey did with phrase find, except you know, if I go to find in a PC, control F on a Mac, command F, you'll see here that I have a tab for script text. So if I want to search to a point where she says uh, something about New York, we'll type in New York. I'll hit find and it's now looking in my script at the multiple times where New York is where she said it in the transcript. And if I want to go to that point in the script, I simply double click and it highlights, takes me to that point. Now, of course, I double click on the mark and I get to early. And in those days in New York, it was in New York. We did everything. I mean, I How about that? So quick overview of script sync. Again, phrase find and script sync are amazing tools inside of Media Composer. But I do want to talk about another piece of the puzzle, which is part of Avid's video post pipeline, the Media Central Editorial Management. Now, this is an asset management tool which doesn't disrupt the editorial process, but does allow for collaboration. Uh, we'll go ahead and get into this. But I do want to point out that basically, the way the system is set up, and we do have shared bundles with this as well, by the way, talk to key code. Uh, you have your media composers. Your media composers are connected to Avid Nexus for project sharing and bin locking. And then another server on top of Avid Nexus is editorial management. This is what manages the assets and lets you go in and use a web browser or use editorial management inside of Media Composer. So let's take a look. We're going to start out with the Media Central Editorial Management web interface. So I'm logging into So I'm logging into Media Central Editorial Management remotely. I'm logging into a system in Burlington, Massachusetts. I'm in Los Angeles. And through the web browser, I have access to my Nexus workspaces, all set by permission. So what I have access to, I can see here. Plus, we can even set up, uh, currently in the latest version, a whitelist system where you can actually decide who has access to what projects as well. So I'm going to open up my editorial management projects. Here are my Avid projects. And let's go into the little travel documentary that I was working on. And I want to go and, you know, you see I have your different views here. You'll also notice that the iconography looks just like the bins from an Avid project. We want to try to make something very familiar. But again, not intrusive to the editor because the editor is working in Media Composer, but the producer, the assistant, or anybody else can be inside of Media Central Editorial Management and looking at media as well. So I'm looking at a bin. You'll notice that there are red locks here. 
So the same project sharing and bin locking that's available in Media Composer is also in Editorial Management. So I can look at media, but I can't make changes to this bin. So let's take a look at some of these beautiful shots from Greece. Uh, we'll go ahead and play some footage. And on the fly, the server that's on top of the Nexus that runs Media Central Editorial Management is creating proxies for playback. The quality is great. Uh, we're asking for about maybe five meg of connectivity uh, to get a good experience, but you can also control in your user settings how the playback's gonna be set up, set up, whether it's good, better, or best, your aspect ratio, latency, and things like that. So you do have some control depending on your connectivity. You can also control the layout. You can have you know a larger display, if you wish, for your video. So you're gonna take a nice little look at this shot right here. The performance is pretty amazing. Uh, also, you can get a full screen playback. So you'll see, let's go to this nice little sunset shot. I think a lot of us would like to be there right now. We'll play that back. So you can get a full screen playback. Very nice. I'll hit escape to get out of that. So uh, being able to go in and browse is the first app that you'll see here in the upper left hand corner. We've sort of limited what can be done here because Depending on the role, depending on what you need to do, you may only need to browse, look at your projects, or search. There is a logging app, so there is customized logging that you can perform. And this is distributed processing, something that is also part of the video post pipeline where you can send off renders and transcodes through Media Composer, uh, almost like a render farm, to idle workstations or systems that aren't being currently used at your facility. Uh, and this just brings up a little dashboard. So currently, again, I'm just browsing. I'm looking through my little breadcrumbs here. Let's say I want to go back to my main travel doc window. Let's go in, we'll go into the interviews. Uh, let's go take a look at, you know, some shots of Kate, Catherine Haight. And again, I'm looking at Avid Media through a web browser, and I could be anywhere. It's totally time code accurate. I can scroll through, I can scrub, I can even start going in and subclip. So if you mark an in and an out, so I could go ahead and hit letter S, just going to put A, Kate, close up, we have success there, and perfect. Then just do a little refresh, and we'll see that that subclip comes up right here. So I could be the editor, I could be the assistant, I could be anybody who needs to manage any of the media here. Just call that A2. It's now creating subclips inside of the bin. So subclipping, again, looking at meters. If I want to see, you know, my levels, because these do have audio. In the program. The drone um, shots didn't, so I didn't get audio meters here. And then uh, modify it, how are different editors you know, I could control the audio just for playback. And here's my metadata. So if I want to go in and start adding a descriptions, so Kate, talks about editing. That's great, but we could also add markers. So I could be here working on the same media that the editor is working on in Media Composer, and I could be adding markers. So we're gonna say Kate um, editing here. Let's say at this point she's talking about script sync. Script sync. And here she's talking about getting her start. All right, so I've added these markers here, which instantly would be seen in the edit bay when they refreshed that media. Now we could also go in and start organizing media. Again, being able to go in and take a look at projects is great. Let's go into the travel doc here. I can right click and create a bin. So in a web browser, anywhere in the world, I'm looking at media somewhere across country, I can go in and create a bin. We're just going to call this dailies, hit create, and the dailies bin pops up here. Of course, it's empty, but I've created that bin. We call this a hyper bin because it's created outside of Media Composer, and I can go in and start organizing media, prepping it, putting it inside of the dailies bin so that when the editor opens up the dailies bin, the media is in there and prepped. Uh, I could also go in and create a new instance of the browser because I want to be able to drag and drop media into that bin. Now I could do that here. Here I have my dailies bin 
and I can navigate to, well, let's say, we'll go back to the interviews, we'll go to Kate, and let's take those two subclips that I created, and I'm going to drag them into the dailies bin. I open up dailies, and there they are. So I could go in and drag media into the bins here and start organizing media. Okay. You'll see it actually created a copy of that media. So it didn't move it from that bin. It actually created a copy from the media inside of that bin here and put it into dailies. Let's just take a couple more. Let's take a couple wide shots. All right, perfect. And we'll drop them into the dailies bin as well. And while we're here, let's just take a couple shots of Doc. Uh, yeah, that's good. I apologize for my phone buzzing. It was particularly helpful. Um... Yeah, we'll take a couple shots of Doc there, drag and drop, put him in the dailies bin. So you'll see multiple clips there. Fantastic. Now at this point, let's take all of these clips, right click, and I'm going to create a sequence just a simple shot list. I can go in and you know reorganize it, just moving the clips in here. We'll go ahead and save this. We'll call this a new sequence. Save that. And what happens when I refresh? I get a new sequence right here. Now that's using the subclips, it's using the full clips. When I double click, that sequence is loaded into my preview window. What's even more exciting is I can bring up a timeline. This is that shot list that I created and I can go in and now perform just some simple trims, some simple movement. Let's say I want to take this clip and move it to the end. So through the web browser, creating a shot list, creating something that the editor will be able to see when they open up this bin, and I'm working remotely is amazing using Media Central Editorial Management. Now I want to jump out to another instance of Media Central Editorial Management to show you something brand new. We just released a new version of the software which allows you to see more of your timeline. So you saw the shot list where you had a single track of video, single track of audio. You actually could create an instance where there's one track of video and a few tracks of audio. But what I want to point out here is let's take a look at another sequence, but it has multiple layers of video and audio. Now, you do have to render your sequences. If you are in editorial management and you're inside of Media Composer and you want somebody to be able to see it through the web browser, you do have to render it. You don't have to mix it down into a file. As long as it's rendered, other people who have permission will be able to see it. Now you will see that if I expand out the sequence right here, this is actually a scene from the television show The Orville, so thank you for the team at Orville who let us use this. So I have a lot more tracks of audio that I could be viewing and listening to right here. But if I bring up the timeline, we have now introduced the ability to see all the tracks of video and all the tracks of Audio. So you're not just limited to the single track of audio and video. Now I can't make any changes here. I can go in and start you know, making comments. So I can go to the markers. Here you're seeing all of the markers that actually were put into the scene from the Orville. So seeing all those markers, being able to access them when you double click is actually very powerful. And again, I'm in a web browser. So uh, we'll go back into the other instance of Media Central Editorial Management, but I just wanted to be able to show you that we do have a lot of new features that have been added to the software. So we'll go ahead and log out and log into We'll go ahead and log into the other instance of Media Central through the web browser. And we mainly were in the Browse app before. So again, I can go in and browse my Avid projects, being able to see Avid Media. Let's go back into the interviews here. 
So here I have doc. Let me go ahead and create a new browse instance. All right. So here we have doc. We'll take the second one. Oops. And here's another way that we can take media. Let's say I want to take uh, some of the drone media. Let's go to Greece. We'll grab these clips. We'll drag them. So you can create multiple instances of the apps, have them side by side, and rather than just having to drop them down through the directory panel, you can actually drag them into the different bins this way with the different browser instances docked as well. Okay. So let's go in and take a look at searching. Searching is a very powerful tool. When you have a lot of assets and you're trying to find something, especially in documentary, I'm going to go to the Browse app, and you'll see that down the left side of, and you'll see that down the left side of the Browse app, you have a whole series of filters. So you can see that uh, anything that has been created in the last you know, 24 hours, there were six assets. Last week, there were 162. I currently have almost a thousand assets on my Nexus system. This is across all of my projects right now. And we can also see that in Master Clips, I have 799. So I can say, show me all 799 of them. Or maybe also add in the sequences, or maybe just the sequences. And any of these filters can be saved. So you can actually, you know, save them as uh, special favorites, or you can also see. So you can also see the recent filters that you have searched as well. So we'll go ahead and clear all the filters because I want to show you that I can type into any pill. The pill is actually the color here. You'll see as I keep adding pills, I can compound my search. Let's go back and say I just want to find any take that has uh, a close-up. So we'll go ahead and search the entire Nexus system for any close-up. And this is in the metadata. So you'll see that if I click on this take right here, the number has three hits. So we'll double click on Stuart Bass. It brings up, brings up the clip of Stuart right here. And if I go to the Hits tab, you'll see if I scroll down, there is a little You'll see there is a blue icon right here for the point where that asset is found with CU, with close-up. You'll see that those little blue dots will be seen wherever there's a match. So there are three instances of close-up. Plus, I want to say let's find any close-up of Kim. We'll add that. It takes us down to 35 clips on the system, and here we have 35 close-ups of Kim. All right, and we can keep adding searches here. There also can be instances where we don't want to just find anything that has Kim and a close-up. Maybe we want to do a search for metadata or the name or phonetic. And this is using that same technology that Corey showed with phrase find within Media Composer, which is phonetically searching across the entire Nexus storage system. So again, you don't have to have a transcription. I can come in right here and I want to find anytime somebody says the word documentary. And I simply pull down the little pill here. We'll say I want to do a phonetic search. And my search gives me 76 instances where it thinks it found a match where somebody said the word documentary. We even see how many times they say it inside of the clip. Now if I go and double click on this take right here of the close-up of Kim, you'll see the number five next to her name. Now we now under the hits tab we do have the metadata tab which again is any metadata like close-up, could be frame rate, could be anything in the name or a comment, but if I go to the phonetic tab, what we see is she says documentary five times in that clip. And this is the time code where she says that word. And if I double click, you'll see relative to the clip itself where she says the word 
The documentary editor, you're creating the script. Documentary. We'll go to another one. The documentary, we're dealing with how people actually talk. You how about that? So let's say we want to do another search, maybe um, the word script. We'll do a phonetic search and the word documentary. And we'll do phonetic on that as well. So multiple phonetic searches on two words, script and documentary. There are 30 results. And we'll go ahead and click on Kim right here. The number 11 comes up and we'll see under the hits tab and phonetic, these are all of the points where she says the word documentary or script. You get your little colored marks here that when you double click, it takes you to each point. And I play. Script Syncon was a documentary called Inequality for All. Script for the film because it's a documentary. Script sync, I was able to piece together audio from all those different sources. So again, amazing technology, an option to Media Central editorial management with the phonetic searching across your entire Nexus storage system. So let's go ahead and take a look at Media Central editorial management as a panel inside of Media Composer. So you may notice in the project management window, and this is the new project management window in 2020.4 that we introduced uh, in Media Composer, you have the Media Central login at the bottom here. Now, I don't necessarily have to be logged into Media Central editorial management in Media Composer to use it in a collaborative environment. That could be left to just the web browser if you wanted to use that. But if I want to use it as a panel inside of Media Composer, I would log into it right here. So I've gained access. I'm going to go into my travel doc project here. And when this loads up, the first thing I want to show you is, look at that. There's a dailies bin. And if I open up the dailies bin, these are the clips that I enter the web browser in editorial management using the hyper bin. So if I double click, you'll see these are the sub clips that I created. These are the shots of doc and these are the drone shots that I brought in. And if I double click, this is the shot list that I created. So these are the elements that I did in creating the sequence. With several different editors who used it when they were cutting. Um, um, I first used script sync when I was working on the show Glee. So again, collaboration, everything is happening inside of the web browser, can be seen by the editors, and I can access editorial management, since I've logged into it here, as a panel inside of Avid Media Composer. So I have the browse and the search app, and you know the new UI with Media Composer? I can float or I can dock my panels. So just go ahead and drop that into the UI. That could be saved as a workspace if I want. But I have that exact same access to my Nexus workspaces right here. So we go to the Avid Projects. I could go into the Travel Doc. Well, I'm already in the Travel Doc project. So the real beauty here is I can go into any project across the network that I have access to. Let's say I want to go to um, a little, we'll go back to the editors over here because I want to bring in shots from um, maybe Stuart Bass. I don't have him right here. I want to go into the editor interviews. Here we have Stuart. And I want to bring in this close-up of Stuart. Now, it's not part of the project right now, but when I double click, it now introduces Stuart and even opens the bin into the project that I'm in. You see the Avid Nexus bins are listed right here. So to wrap things up here, Dan talked about Phrase Find and Script Sync and how he used it in his documentary work. Uh, Corey was able to show Phrase Find. I showed Script Sync and Media Composer. And uh, editorial management is a great collaborative tool, a great way to work collaboratively with a web browser inside of Media Composer, being able to search across your entire network with the technology of Phrase Find with the phonetic search. Um, if you do want to talk any more or get a closer look to any of this as well, uh, please talk to Key Code, and they can talk to you about how to set up bundles to uh, set this up for your environment. So um, I think at this point, we'll be able to pass it on for any 
questions uh, you may have, we're happy to open up channels. So uh, go ahead, Kiko, take it away. All right, thanks for the tech dive, folks. Let's get into the live Q&A. We got a few questions that are in already, so everyone's out there is encouraged to send your questions in via the Vimeo, Facebook Live, or YouTube chat, depending on what platform you're on. Uh, first thing out there, Danielle is asking how well phrase find is going to work if someone has an accent. Oh, you want to pick that up? <laughs> Basically, a uh, phrase find is phonetics. Uh, if you can get a language uh, pack, you can download it from the Avid Download Center, which uh, includes, I think, about 20 different languages because it will index according to language, but it is a phonetic search. So, I mean, if you could type in, you know, a, a, a word that represents what you think you're trying to search for, even if it's in a different language, and it will do its best to find it. Awesome. So, um... Brecht is asking, does phrase find work with other languages, French, German, Dutch? Yeah, absolutely. Again, the, there is a language pack. It defaults to English, but the language pack does include the uh, other languages, um, Italian, German, uh, Spanish. Uh, uh, you can actually, if you look at the, there's an FAQ, um, I think we'll either post that or an FAQ uh -huh. for script sync and phrase find, which actually lists the languages that it does support. Very cool. Um, Christopher Schultz is asking, in the past, phrase find has only searched bins that have been, that have the project tag metadata of the project you're working in. Will it now index bins that were created in a different project as long as copy of that bin is placed in your existing project? This probably also feeds into how, um, how um, Media Central Editorial Management's phonetic search works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and good question. Again, it is based on the project. So if you do introduce the bin from another project to your current one, it will search in that. So again, if it's in the project, phrase find will find it. But to Jeff's point, uh, Media Central Editorial Management looks across your entire nexus. So you're not limited if you are trying to find something um, or somebody said something in another project and you don't know where it came from. It's just added value there. Makes sense, and and that that's determined. The, the pricing on that is determined by hours of me media you're going to search, and you don't have to search everything. You can uh, restrict certain areas. So, um, let's see here. Uh, Richard is asking a little off the phonetic uh, pipeline, but for documentary work, we receive a lot of different media types, like HEVC, iPhone. A weakness of Avid is the inability to natively bring that media into Avid, as opposed to other NLEs. Can you address solutions to this problem? Um, I can address the solution to that problem, fix it in pre. It's possible to go into the settings of an iPhone and turn off HEVC. Just shoot as most compatible. That will eliminate the variable frame rate. Um, I saw this problem with reality TV about a decade ago when flip, uh, flip cameras went over to iPhones. You just turn it off and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the settings are easily accessible and uh, the instructions are easily findable uh, with a quick Google search. Uh, just, just if I can put, jump in there quickly sure. as well, um, you know, HEVC and other formats, you know, we, we introduced the, the UME, the Universal Media Engine, which uh, is taking away our reliance on QuickTime. This was introduced in 2020.4. And uh, basically, being able to link to HEVC um, is coming up. Uh, we just introduced, you know, a variable frame rate sort, uh, support in 2020.6. So, um, again, more formats, more um, compatibility and development with the new UME uh, technology that we built into the software. So, uh, stay tuned. Very cool. Uh, a couple questions from Jasari. Uh, script sync question. Is it possible to go from the sequence via script sync to a script that can be exported to a text file? Um, Fortunately, no. I mean, basically, you can take a, a script, and once it's sunk up, I think I showed it in, in the demo, uh, you can pull down a modifier and take clips and add it to a sequence, um, but you can't go in the other direction. Uh, we did add some stuff for people who didn't know. Uh, when we reintroduced Script Sync back into Media Composer, you can go in and edit your script, something that we couldn't do before. So uh, when people have, you know, ad libs or they need to make, you know, modifications, it wasn't easy to go into the file. So just another thing that we added is there's a button on top of the script sync window, which lets you edit. So you can actually, you know, change words, you can find and replace, and you can also add new dialogue that might be in there and then resync that up. 
Which also would probably give you access to things like select all, copy, go to a text editor, paste, done. Correct. So, I mean, you can't go from the sequence back to the script, but uh, you can go in the other direction. Okay. Um, just somebody else had a question about long form. We'll, we'll pick that up a little later. Um, EC Productions is asking what kind of hardware is needed to implement this. I can answer that. Um, this is Corey. So there is some specs for that on the on the editorial management FAQ, which I guess you'll be sharing. But just uh, just to cover the editorial management itself requires a, a single server to run editorial management and all the services that go with it. Um, and you do need Nexus. Um, so it's basically an Intel Xeon server, and then it needs to be running Microsoft Windows Server 2016. And there are more specifics in the FAQ. Um, you don't need any hardware to have the phrase find option. Um, obviously, that's just a software license. Yep. Well, you will have to have Media Composer running on a computer. Yep. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you probably have the hardware already. Uh, let's see here. Um, a uh, comment from Scott Arundale. The interface looks a lot more user-friendly than the MC bin viewer. Uh, and then a question from Mike. Uh, can we outline the difference between phrase find and phonetic index and how much each can access on a uh, system or a uh, basically an infrastructure? Uh, it should be able to access uh, anything. The, the, the idea and, and the beautiful thing as far as, you know, phrase find inside of Media Composer, again, as uh, Corey mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's in the software. So as soon as you introduce media to the project, it's basically invisible to the editor. Uh, when you have the uh, phrase find feature, the indexing is all done in the background, and there are settings that will allow you to you know, do a little pre-roll for your uh, syncing, also choosing where it's being indexed. Um, and basically, you you just set that up, and it just it works. Um, again, by the confidence, by how you know confident it is, it think it thinks it found a match. So if you're typing for you know, gee, I wish it would do this, you know, you could type in W O O D, which is would, and it still may find it. Um, so you know, the, the hits and the results might you know be different than what you think, but again, it is phonetic technology. It's amazing technology built into the software. Different than the, the server-based uh, phonetic searching, which goes across the entire system and is, um, again, done on the ed editorial management side. So it's taking it to a different level, being able to expand across the entire uh, project. So it, it's a little more robust. It's a little more, if, if you are looking at, you know, thousands and thousands of assets across your entire network, you're going to need something a little stronger to be able to support that. And just, you, you can go ahead, Corey. Just to add one last thing there to, to Michael's point is that, um, and with editorial management and the phrase find uh, or the index there is that you don't need to know what bin you're searching in, you know, whereas in, in the phrase find option in media composer, you need to at least have that bin in your project. And the other thing with editorial management and phonetic searching is you can do this with a lightweight browser. You don't have to have Media Composer running to do that. So as long as you can see the um, the engine, or whether that's you know on on prem or you're connecting in through a VPN, you can access and and search for material. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Christopher had a follow up question. Uh, follow up on phrase find indexing bins from other projects copied into active project will it still index bins that are organized into folders or does the index only reach bins at that root level of the project um, I'm pretty certain it should index any media in the project I don't think it's limited to just uh, folders on the root level yeah so and this also is you know linked media you know if you are linking to media or creating avid media it is still searchable as Phonetics through phrase find, and that's been my experience as well. You also, um, you know, from coming up on the support side, you can blow away the entire phonetic index for a project and re-index it. So that's it'll just redo that section that's there, which means that if you'd open bins from another project into it, you would need to redo the same if you've gotten rid of the index for whatever reason. Which is also important, you know, if you are working in shared environments. Again, if you're working as an island and you're on your laptop and you're searching, that that's your one index. But we put in a tool to let you choose a single point of indexing so that everybody, if they're in a shared environment, aren't 
recreating multiple versions of the index for a phrase find because it tends to bog down the system. So you can actually have, if you are, again, are in a shared environment, have the one place where the phonetics are being indexed and you're basically uh, helping the support of the system. It's not searching over multiple indexes for uh, the phonetics. Interesting. So, uh, interesting follow-up question there from Christopher as well on that same point. If different editors are working on the same show, a la Nexus, um, does the indexing need to be done separately on every machine, or can the different systems share an already created index? The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, you can go in again to your settings, and if you choose the single index, then uh, everybody will use that one index. Again, that was something when a uh, phrase found was first introduced. If you're working on a reality show, every system that opened up Media Composer was creating their own index and just bogged things down. Mm -hmm. So adding in this new feature just really, uh, really helped. Awesome. Uh, Brecht had a follow-up question as well. Do the clips need to be processed for phonetic find? They need to be uh, indexed, but that happens automatically as, as content is ingested into the system. So that... Um, Unlike with the phrase find option where you actually need to make sure that the bin has been opened in your project in in editorial management with the with the phrase find the phonetic index basically as content is brought in it, it is automatically indexing all of those audio files in the background um, and to Jeff's point we do it does get sold um, based on number of hours that you want to be indexed at a time awesome so uh, looks like we're, we got a few questions wander off from the phonetic thing. So Jasari uh, had a, also a question that said, I missed the first 10, 15 minutes. Is there a best practice recommended for long form with source material from multiple cameras, including archival SD material? It gets into the documentary sort of concept. Uh, best practice. Best practice. It's always funny. Best practice is different for everybody. So it's, it's hard to say best practice. I mean, every documentary... Um, editor, TV, film has their working with uh, their teams. Um, working with, I mean, the best thing that I would say is know or have a good naming convention, have something that's common enough that is familiar to everybody or easy to, to search on and work with. Um, and also, depending on what you're coming from, I mean, it's, is it, camera footage that you're transcoding and needing to be able to track back to the original footage. You want to make sure that you catalog everything properly on, you know, external drives or your archival system so that, again, it's easily accessible and familiar to everybody. Just to cre create something common that uh, everybody can use. Definitely. Um, I've been on the, the finishing side of a few feature documentaries, and... The more organized you can be and the more easily things will link back to the original source material. Sometimes that even goes back into archival 16 millimeter. Um, I remember the, the conform process for eight days a week was, um, it was just painful. Uh, online editor was there for, you know, uh, you know, days straight, you know, snoozing on the couch every once in a while, but it was just a long, painful process. So. You either need the best conform editor on the planet or you need to be extremely organized up front and knowing that that original material is going to need to be linked back to. So even if you've homogenized it to work uh, in the creative space because, you know, maybe you're just using a small external drive for footage, um, getting that process to take a lot less time, a lot less expensive time. Conform is not an inexpensive process. Um... That would be recommended. Um, ooh, uh, one question from Kevin. Is the shared index point cross-platform? Our experience with the shared index point in MC caused issues in the past because paths are different between PC and Mac. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I would have to find out if there is an issue. I, I haven't heard that, but I don't hear all situations. Yeah. So that, that's a very valid point. Um, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a repost of the questions and answers that are available, but we can uh, we can look into that. I, I would I, I've never heard of the issue coming up in an avid shared storage environment. If you're dealing with other platforms that mount things differently, you might have that. Um,
Yeah, like Michael said, it's it's never come up before. So interesting, interesting question. Sure. Um, re, you know, please reach out to us if you've got a specific issue that you want us to look into, um, and you know, specific things we can look at in terms of uh, how a, a system's uh, set up and calibrated and all that other fun stuff. Um, all right. Um, can you limit search to just one bin? i.e. you have bins with different interviewees and you want to find a word from just one person. You could never get this to work in the old phrase find. Ooh, from one person. I don't think you can limit and say, I need one person. I don't think you can add a metadata element to your, your phrase find. Again, the simplicity of it is, you know, it's going to find everything. Um, I think there might be an option I would have to bring it up to say search active bin. So maybe if you have that selected, um, just like in find, it will only find if you have just one person in that bin, maybe it'll just look. But again, I'd have to bring up the UI and check and see. Um, the one thing in phrase find to do is, okay, you've got the bin that only has the one person, create a new project, open it into that, search there. That's only that material. Done. Um, <laughs> My co-editor, uh, yeah, someone, just a comment from Jasari. My co-editor's on a Mac and I'm on a PC. We've had no problems with script sync or phrase find. So that, that, hey, that, thank you. that's that particular <laughs> thing. Yes, thanks a lot, Jasari. Um, so a couple last questions that are definitely not um, phonetic related. Uh, we work with a lot of ProRes and Media Composer. Any plans to support ProRes and Cloud UX? Last I checked, requires tra transcode to something else or is it supported now? Same question for ProRes Media Support for Global Phrase Find and Media Central. Uh, the ProRes Raw, is that what? Uh, it doesn't say Raw, it just says ProRes. Because we now support ProRes. Again, I, I don't know in, in Media Central, my assumption is we, yeah, we don't, do. We don't currently officially support ProRes and Media Central, um, the keyword being officially support it. Uh, um, so that's my official answer on that. Uh, I, I do think that there's um, things being worked on, but yeah, we currently still do not officially support ProRes and Media Central. And as far as ProRes and Media Composer, that is coming. We can create ProRes uh, with the 2020.4 version of Media Composer on a PC, so you can export ProRes, but uh, we will be linking to it and supporting it, ProRes Raw directly. So, okay. Uh, Christopher's asking, what versions of MC um, does this new iteration of Freeze Find work with? Um, just to go back to 2018, 2019, how far back can you go? We actually reintroduced uh, Freeze Find in version 8.8 .8 of Media Composer. Uh, we took a little time off when we were renegotiating our contract and uh, Instead of renegotiate, renegotiating, we actually bought the technology and the developers for it. So it's uh, something that only we can do. But yeah, Media Composer 8.8 .8 is when we reintroduced it back into the uh, software. Very cool. Well, I mean, that's all the time we have for today. So my apologies to Matt Damon. If you've got questions on phonetic technology inside of Media Composer or Avid questions in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Keycode Media, keycodemedia.com. If you happen to be on YouTube today, please like and subscribe to be informed on upcoming broadcast and post episodes. I want everyone to have a great holiday weekend. Uh, Michael, Corey, big thanks for joining us. Uh, also, Dan, thanks for joining us for t telling us all about Docs, and uh, everyone have a great holiday weekend. Great. Thank you. Thank you.